Welcome to the Trust and Productivity webinar today, uh, hosted by the British Property Federation. We are expecting in excess of 100 people participating. So the web webinar presenters today, uh, Alan Bunting, Head of Development Delivery, British Land, Katie Dowding, Executive Vice President, Skanska, uh, Helen Ellsby, Chief Solutions Officer, Heathrow Airport, and myself, uh, Graham Zipper, uh, Basically, I work for the construction clients group and also the clubs and client group, and I'm your chair for today. So the agenda, having just done the introduction, um, I'm going to briefly go through the playbook drivers. Uh, Alan will talk us through the background to the playbook, and then um, we'll get a supplier's view uh, from Katie, forming effective collaborative-based partnerships, and then finally, uh, Helen will take us through Heathrow's long-standing approach to their collaborative um, working. So although not um, necessarily following the playbook, but they've been doing it for many, many years, and um, most of what they do just sit nicely with the playbook, as Helen will explain. And then finally at the end, the Q&A session. So there are 10 drivers um, for success identified in the playbook. And I'll put in the chat the link to the playbook as we go through so you can actually uh, click on that and download it for yourselves. But running through in order, there's form effective partnerships, adopt portfolio and longer term contracting, adopt an outcome based approach, embed digital information flows and technologies, involve supply chain early, benchmark objectives, allocate risk fairly and appropriately, pay fairly, assess the economic and financial standing of, of suppliers and promote innovation and continuous improvement. So if I hand over to Alan now, stop sharing the screen and then Alan will actually give us some background to the um, playbook. Thank you again and uh, good morning all. Um, First of all, uh, some background to where uh, the, the playbook has, has come from. Um, it was incepted originally by uh, Be The Business, a not-for-profit organisation whose, whose sole aim is to be able to increase the productivity within UK uh, economy. Um, it was seen that from 1997 to 2019 that the construction industry was losing pro productivity by 0.6% each year. And that sort of was at odds with the wider UK economy, 2.8% uh, growth in pro productivity and in manufacturing at 3.9%. So back in 2020, um, a group was, was, was established and it consisted of um, a variety of uh, contractors, uh, subcontractors, consultants and um, construction clients and developers. The aim of that group um, was to be able to identify um, areas of both experience and areas of opportunity that we could find to be able to, uh, to de demonstrate uh, elements of best practice, not only from within the construction industry, but gaining that from outside, especially from manufacturing and bring that into construction. From that tipped out a, a, a wide variety of thoughts and, and ideas that, that, that were worked through. These were eventually distilled down into three key work streams. One was, um, for, first of all, identifying the metrics by which to define productivity. And this was done through both benchmarking and the collection of construction data. Uh, the formation of the Construction Data Trust came about to hold that information as a um, uh, widely shared uh, repository of information. Second to that was the productivity measurement framework, a, a guide where it was launched in, in, entitled Me Measuring Construction Site Productivity the seven step uh, framework for success. Um, and that used two um, pilot sites that, that we had, one the Forge, the other one, uh, Northern Folgate, to be able to identify ways of being able to, to measure um, site pro productivity and to be able to identify some of the drivers that sit behind it. And thirdly, the collaborative contracting co component or effectively the pro productivity playbook. And this took its, it steer from the public sector playbook. It um, sought to, to, to pick up on those items from the public sector playbook, which were applicable to the private sector, uh, tune those and to be able to em embellish them further to suit, as, as Graham discussed before, those 10 uh, key dri driving factors. Um, 
over the period of about a year, year or so, there was a group group of us as they from from, from that um, uh, assembled mix of both clients, contractors, uh, suppliers, and consultants who drafted uh, the book, reviewed it, uh, had them peer, peer reviewed it, and, and shaped more widely. And it was published last year in uh, in uh, November. <clears throat> the main objectives of the playbook um, was to inject some. I suppose some, some trust and collaboration back into the in industry. It was seen that, that occasionally it's quite ad adversarial. Occasionally it is low, lowest price, not best value. And occasionally there are some behaviours in there, which I'm sure we can all identify with, which, which really work against uh, sites being productive and efficient. And moreover, the entire uh, de development pro process not being um, as smooth as perhaps it could be. From that came, um, as I say, the, those 10 drivers for success. And within the guide itself, there are nine separate chapters which should have take you through um, a guide, a, a how-to guide, as it were, as to be able to identify um, the areas by which one can lever those success factors. Um, they, as I say, they're guiding pr principles. They're not rules. They are not site or size specific. They're not pipeline or location specific. It's certainly not just a London thing. It's a UK wide thing. It is something that can be applied ir irrespective of, of, of scale. And there are some common factors throughout the whole lot, which I'm sure we can all I identify with. Um, our experience of, of not only using the guide, but in, in some of the the works that went behind its its inception um, was to uh, was to trial uh, early engagement, um, trial um, fr framework agreement. So the project behind me, actually at 100 Liverpool Street, was was part of our Broadgate framework uh, with Sir Robert Cowpine. It's a it's a ten year uh, program of of works. Um, it's just over 1.5 billion pounds worth of um, construction. And it was set up on the basis of trust, honesty, and collaboration. And that sort of runs straight the way through all of the pro projects which go through that pipeline. There's a co-located team, there's bags of, of supplier and uh, subcontractor engagement very early on, and certainly way, way before the, 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 the procurement parts of the project are considered. So as to try and iron out any issues that we have with teams, with the design, the build buildability of that design, the appropriateness of that design, any market influence that may come from that and ensuring ultimately that um, the labor and, and, and materials are where they should be as, as they should be on site so as to uh, so as to assist for highest levels of pro productivity. So we, we are keen to, to continue that and we've certainly done so on, on other sites again with early engagement, defining what, what success looks like on, on those and as they working through those, those guiding principles. Um, I'd, I'd like to sort of flag sort of three key tools, which which for me um, from the play, playbook certainly work work well, and we've had the most traction with. Uh, first one is to form effective partnerships. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a lot of risk involved. There's a lot of mi mistrust, perhaps, as to who owns the risk and whose responsibility um, that risk is uh, to, to to discharge. And I think there is a propensity for for that to be pushed further and further down the supply chain to those without the bank balance or, or, or necessarily the, the time to be able to review that risk. So uh, uh, appropriateness of those partnerships, appropriateness of resolving where that risk lies um, is, is, ab is, is absolutely key. Um, defining the values that, um, that you want from the project team and ultimately defining the goals to which everybody can then run towards. Um, Quite often, I'm sure we've all experienced where people are on different end, ends of the rope, but ensuring that they're all on that same end and pulling in the right direction and, and know what good looks like, know what success lo looks like, ultimately uh, really, really helps. Um, tailored pr procurement stra strategies, so through the allocation um, of, of risk, as I mentioned before, will will assist that process, ensuring is a, that the uh, early engagement of those subcontractors is brought, brought about. Um, and the commercial advantages that that might bring. Lastly, is establish great site accommodation because without the guys and girls on site fe feeling loved and care cared for, they're not going to be at their most produ productive. If you're cold, you're wet, you can't get some decent food, you're not going to be work working at, at your best. 
uh, being able to ensure that um, there is a fair and e equitable share of that, of that space, there's su suitable drying, messing um, and washing facilities are all really sim simple, simple points. But we certainly find out that from those with, with the best site welfare f facilities, you get the best level of engagement from everybody on, on site. And ultimately that leads through to pro productivity. So with, with that, Gren, if I may hand, hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. That's fantastic. Thank you. Right. So next up is uh, Katie uh, Downing, and she is going to talk to us about forming effective collaborative based partnerships. Over to you, Katie. Morning, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about forming effective collab uh, collaborative partnerships. Now, when we did the initial analysis uh, by Accenture as part of the Construction Productivity Task Force, we were looking at the drivers of productivity. But actually, one of the things that we really found is, is as much as look at the drivers, it's actually about removing the barriers to poor production levels. And fragmentation, lack of transparency, adversarial contract forms, all of those result in a breakdown of trust, which are, of course are the barriers to collaboration and certainly the enemy of productivity. Uh, <clears throat> Alan made reference to it, you know, energy waste in conflict result in inefficiencies, non-productive effort, and certainly a loss of end value. So then comes the challenge of how do you drive change in a highly competitive, diffuse, low margin industry? Well, for me, and certainly what we see in the playbook uh, here, it's actually about setting yourself up for success at the outset and throughout the contract. And to do that, you need to form effective collaborative partnerships. And that's what we try to do with the playbook, uh, hence the sort of subtitle trust and productivity as well. But, you know, we need to be mature about this. This isn't blind or naive trust. It's open. It's structured. It's collaborative trust, which is transparently set out. And this needs to be set at the outset. And that's what we see in the first driver in the playbook, form effective partnerships. And. So to expand on that a little bit more, this initial foundation that looks at, you know, coming together and creating shared objectives, establishing the priorities for a project or the uh, framework and setting out the principles for the culture. And absolutely to the earlier points about understanding and appropriately apportioning risk, putting it in the right place. But all of us understanding what those risks are. Now, of course, the client has got a key role in setting this out. But I think the most important thing that it's got to be agreed and bought into in a collaborative manner by all the parties. So you need to have everyone in the room when you're discussing these things. And actually, everybody in the room has to have a voice. Everyone's got to be heard. Their opinions got to be listened to and respected. And key aspects of this are the discussed in the playbook. So, for example, it talks about at the outset agreeing a statement of objectives actually defining what success is going to look like, establishing clear roles and responsibilities, and providing clear governance and empowerment. And really, really important this is the early engagement. And it's through this we can nurture a collaborative and a cohesive culture. Now, the other thing that's going to be really important this is actually focusing on the outcome. So taking an outcome-based approach to projects. And this is where we really need the client, the contractor and the supply chain to agree what they're trying to achieve. Now, as you can see from this diagram, this might sound obvious. But all the drawing specifications, models and images in the world don't make up for a collaborative discussion and agreement. Construction projects are made up of thousands of decisions every day, ranging from the macroeconomic to the microeconomic. For example, a project might have an overall carbon target set, um, but there might actually be a client or a project aspiration to go beyond that, a desired outcome. Now, the contract documentation, the specifications um, uh, will set out that target as a given number. It's, but it also might say uh, materials used in the project can be equal or approved. Now, if this if there isn't the shared understanding of the desire to outperform in terms of carbon, 
hundreds of decisions to substitute materials could be made every day, collectively resulting in significant impact in, in terms of carbon, either big or small. However, if everyone around the table, from the supply chain to the contractor, to the developer, the client, all understand, it will help inform every decision made. That desired outcome will be in people's minds, affecting those choices that they make with everything from cornicing to concrete. So a collaborative relationship with a shared understanding of outcomes can avoid misalignment and can help with uh, can help us deal with misalignment of expe expectations, which of course ultimately results in dissatisfaction or even redundant work. So uh, as a contractor, one of my views of the playbook, well, it's certainly really welcome. I don't, I don't think it's anything new, but what it does do, it pulls together all the elements of best practice and gives us some really practical tools. Now, for sure, working in this way does take a little bit more time up front. It does take a bit more thought and planning at the beginning, but actually the long-term benefits that are achieved far outweigh this. I think the other really exciting thing about this is if we move to these more collaborative outcome-focused ways of working, We've got the real potential to unlock the supply chain for mutual benefit of everyone involved. Now, yes, that means efficiency and effectiveness and increased productivity. But I think for me, the other really exciting thing is the opportunity to unlock innovation potential. There are so many opportunities for innovation that are missed by late engagement, particularly with the supply chain where the really creative, inventive ideas come from. So. How we get on at Skanska with embedding these practices? Uh, well, I don't think there's anything new here, as I said earlier. So all of the elements of the playbook are being applied to some extent across our portfolio of projects. But for me, I think the real opportunity is about to apply to if we can apply all of them all of the time. But of course, <laughs> the real thing about that is you can't, as I said, it's a collaborative effort. No one organization can make that happen. It requires all the parties the client, the supply chain, all to work, contractor, all to work together to achieve this. Uh, so I thought I'd give you a couple of examples where some of the elements of the playbook are being put into place uh, in Skanska. So in chapter nine, we talk about the improved transition to handover and effective aftercare. Um, and I think this is actually getting a particular focus as well as we think about the golden thread of information uh, when we look at the implementation of the Building Safety Act. So in this document, we uh, give a case study example of 51 Moorgate, which actually happens to be our London office. So in this example, we provided not only an asset rich twin, but also an intelligent building management system, which helped the building occupier, in this case ourselves, to not only track and manage the building correctly to ensure that it was performing in line with the original specification and desired outcomes, but actually has also enabled us to find ways to enhance performance, which have led to improved end user outcomes, such as improved air quality and control of internal environment conditions. It's also delivered energy savings of about 35% and reduced, <coughs> excuse me, reduced maintenance costs by about 8% and has had some significant associated carbon reductions. Another example of <coughs> an element of the playbook being put into application is the use of 4D digital rehearsals to measure success and check in. We talk about this in chapter eight of the playbook because continuous improvements at the heart of improving productivity. The utilization of 4D models is included in this case studies in this document. And this shows how the use of 4D models are used to collect production data and using 4D modeling compare actual progress on the project against planned progress and that allows for real-time production management adjustments to be made. But it also allows for the capture of data on completion, for digital debriefs, so that we can establish lessons learned and inform new projects going forwards. So <clears throat> is this just all about big contractors or can it be used by smaller contractors? Well, Alan said it earlier, there's absolutely no limit to the scale of contractual projects that the playbook principles can be applied to. What's at the heart of it is getting the principles understood and being put in place at the outset. But actually, it's also about looking at which elements can be applied, even if you can't do them all. 
The playbook's got some really simple takeaways and tools that can be picked up by any organisation, whatever the size. So what are my three tools that I would like to flag to the audience? And it's interesting because actually maybe we should have. We didn't collaborate on these uh, before, but I'm, I'm quite pleased to see some uh, common thinking <laughs> between certainly between Alan and I. I. I look forward to see what Helen thinks. Um, so as well as the 10 drivers that run through the chapters, the top three tools that I pick out to highlight in the document, but I will say they are all good and there's lots in there. The first one for me is about setting yourself up for success. So set up a project charter and vision at which that defines success. You get the right positive culture, it aligns the goals, provides collective accountability and provides specific metrics. It also allows that focus on the outcomes to be understood. So that would be my, my first one I would pick out. Second one, set up a clear project risk management agreement based on project goals. And this is really about discussing and understanding the risks and actually making sure that they're placed in the best place to be managed for the benefit of the project. And third, I too would also uh, have the upfront thinking around the project set up. So I think for me, that, that enhances productivity by better quality working environments. It creates a culture of respect. Um, but actually, it really helps with collaboration. Everybody working together alongside each other. You get to understand each other and discuss and ensure you're aligned with outcomes. So those would be my three tools. Uh, glad, glad we uh, matched up on a couple, Alan, which is very good. <laughs> uh, and lovely. I'd hand back to you now, Gwen. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. That was really, really um, covered all the points very eloquently. Thank you. Right. It's... Uh, Helen's turn now on Heathrow's long-standing approach to um, how they work and how it sits with the with, with the playbook, which touches on really what Kate was saying also in terms of a lot of this is not new, matter of um, how best you actually uh, pull these parts together. Over to you, Helen. Great, thank you, Gren, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me along to, to partake in this today. Um, I, I won't lie, um, when you sort of mentioned it to me, Gren and, uh, and Ian, um, I said, of course, I'm happy to come and talk about how Heathrow uh, does things. And then, uh, and then afterwards, I went, I haven't been involved in the playbook. I don't actually know what it says. Uh, this could get quite embarrassing. So the really good news is as I've sort of been through the playbook and, and had a good read, um, I was actually really comforted by the amount of times I was just nodding along with the things that are written in the playbook. Um, you know, as you say, a lot of the, the concepts in there, a lot of the, the tools and techniques and things that we have been doing um, at Heathrow for a while. But, but actually, for me, it was just fantastic to read it, to go, someone's written it all down in one place. Um, so thank you to Katie and Alan and those others of you who've been involved in this, because, you know, to me, I think it will bring a really good sort of industry common standard, common knowledge um, together in one place, not only so that even us at Heathrow can sort of use that with our new starters and, and in our induction and things, but also coming back to your point, Katie, about how, um, you know, is it just for large contractors or large clients like ourselves? I think this will really benefit everybody to have a common language so that even if you're a smaller organisation, client or um, uh, supplier, um, you know, understanding the, the words that are used, the, the, the things, if you're further down in the supply chain, knowing that the language that the main client and the contractors are talking about will really help benefit to see how you fit um, into that picture. So, so first off, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to everybody from a very selfish perspective of having put nothing in. I am sure to get a lot out. So a little bit more about Heathrow then. So, you know, where have we come from and how does that play into the playbook? Actually, when I started my career at Heathrow, um, we had a, a change in leadership uh, at the same time that I joined. And it was very interesting to um, get a set of rules that came out that will be every project will be tendered. Thou will not go out and socialise with a, a supplier or a contractor. And uh, having not had the history of what Heathrow was like before I joined, I was really surprised by this. And actually, now I look back on my ooh, 
12 years, dare I say, history of Heathrow. Um, do you know, it's just incredible how much waste was created through that period of time. Um, so I'm just going to sort of take Katie's lead, really, and start with long term relationships and how we've really changed that position um, over the past um, few years at Heathrow. Um, you know, we now uh, I feel that long term relationships and collaborative relationships are just sitting at the heart of how you get a productive, healthy, safe, um, innovative environment um, when you're doing the works. Um, you know, when we've we've got obviously a long term portfolio, if we just kind of ignore the last two years when it all went a bit wrong. But, um, you know, looking forwards now, we're hoping to get back into that long term portfolio of work. So to me, long term relationships, long term frameworks are the answer because you really get the opportunity to understand your supply chain for your supply chain to really understand what's important to us as a client you come back to those setting project objectives setting those goals you know for me to have a supply chain that understands how our operation runs to understand what is important to the passenger when they're out working in a live environment you know all of those things are really hard to understand if you just come in do a project and go out again so actually that you know setting up your project at the start, understanding those objectives, those success criteria, you know, really are helped. That's a much shorter period of time if you've got those long standing relationships in place. You know, learning from project to project, being able to understand what went wrong last time and what can we do differently next time? How can we do things quicker? How can we build the learnings from one project into the design and the planning for the next project? All of those things really drive better, um, you know, better outcomes and certainly better productivity. And as you touched on in the end, actually, Katie, around innovation, you know, I truly believe that innovation is, um, you know, you've got to um, foster an environment where innovation can yield great outcomes, but can also fail. You know, innovation doesn't come without us getting things wrong sometimes. And actually, if you have a very transactional relationship, it's very easy for a failure of innovation to be seen as a you're not performing, you're doing a bad thing. What are you doing bringing this idea that was useless to us? You know, actually having longer term collaborative, open, honest conversations enables that um, environment of being able to to go. We think this is a good idea. Let's have a go. Let's control it. Let's see what happens and let's learn from it. So all of those things to me really impound why, you know, we've chosen a route of, of long term relationships and frameworks um, at Heathrow. And sort of moving on to um, sort of other things in the playbook that jumped out at me, you know, modern methods of construction is a, is a term that's used all over the place. And I really actually liked the way the playbook brought to life such different elements of it, um, you know, around the standardised components, around off-site manufacture and all these things that now can really start to move us forwards in terms of how we design and build and, and carry out um, these really important projects. You know, off-site manufacture in particular for us is a really, still a really big ambition of ours at Heathrow. You know, working in an airside environment um, you know, in the heart of our operation is still probably, I would say, our biggest constraint in terms of how much work we can do, but also how much productivity we can achieve. And so really moving things off site outside our boundary and bringing them thing is such a big value opportunity for us. We've done quite a bit of this in the past, um, I would say, in sort of particular tailored projects where it's enabled it to work. But what I'm really hoping now for is that we change our mindset where we start to think about where can we take things off site? Where can we really drive carbon um, 
reducing solutions in by things being off site and not in the middle of the operation? Where can we really drive down any health and safety risk for things being done off site in a controlled way? Where can we reduce our long um, life cycle costs through standardized components rather than everything having to be sort of purpose built in and around the operation that we have today? So all of those things, it's a where do we how do we start start with the mindset of everything being built off site and then work out what can't be and bring that off site rather than our mindset in the past that tends to be the other way around and it's quite interesting actually when you talk about um you know modern methods of construction and um and you know things like the use of digital and you know all those tools that we have now I'm, I'm always fascinated by my stakeholders who continually say, when are you starting on site? When are you starting on site? When are you starting on site? Because to them, that's kind of the point where they feel like the, the, the project is finally being done. Again, for me, what I'm trying to sort of change the mindset is that actually your best outcomes come when you build more time into your planning. How can you build it more um, productive? How can you shorten the time periods how can you build it off site all of the innovation needs to go in at the front end we are never ever going to solve our carbon challenges by rushing to site all of our carbon solutions need to be built in in our design phases in our planning phases and all those things so to me the answer to the productivity challenge is in all those good things that are in the playbook about what you need to do up front before you get on site. And if we can try and change that mindset that the, the start on site is the, the point that everybody rushes to, I think we will really drive some value out across all of the projects we do. I touched on digital transformation. Um, I think there was a title somewhere in the playbook, which I loved, which was just like digital, digital, digital. Um, absolutely. If COVID has taught us nothing else, how much have we come forward just in our day to day lives about how much more you can achieve? Webinars like this, where I'm sat in my office, Alan and Katie and Grana are sat where they are, but being able to share best practice and things. Digital is such a huge opportunity for our industry. I'm probably at Heathrow underestimating just how much we have done in this space. We have a lot of digital tools enabled to us. A lot of our systems are in place. But for me, there is so much still to go after at Heathrow. We're still quite segmented in um, the digital tools that we use in our design, the digital tools we use in our construction, and probably most importantly for me, the digital tools that our operation use when we hand over our assets and our projects to them. Joining up all those elements to continue to all buy into the same model that actually designs it, it builds it, we understand it, we can measure how well we're building it, that literally just gets handed over to our engineering teams to maintain and operate when we're finished is, you know, such a big um, opportunity for us that I think we all need to, you know, as an industry come together to, to work out how we can get to that end goal as soon as possible, because that takes cost out for everyone all the way through the value chain. And again, coming back to the productivity, that's what makes everything quicker, which means everybody gets to their end goal sooner. The last thing I wanted to touch on before I hand back to Gren was just around risk. So we've all mentioned risk. Um, I think, in fact, Katie, as you say, we didn't sort of collaborate on what we were going to say, but I think you even said the words I'm about to say, which is about risk needs to be aligned to the best, the party best place to manage it. And when I was sort of doing my, um, my uh, uh, prep for this, I sat there going, how can I just say that? Everybody just says that. So it's a really, really easy thing to say, isn't it? But my goodness, is it a, quite a hard thing to actually implement? And so I was trying to, in my head, sort of think about, you know, we, we do a lot of this at Heathrow, a lot of conversations around how to apportion risk. And I think you really put it rightly, Kately, when you said everybody in the room needs to be there to have a good quality conversation about risk underpinned by a backbone of good relationships, underpinned by a backbone of collaboration, honesty and trust. Because actually the devil's in the detail with risk to me. 
it's probably easiest to work out who's best placed to manage the risk. But what value do you assign to the risk? What does it mean for your schedule in terms of when risks occur? And what does that mean for the commitments and the milestones that you put down in place? How do you actually drill down on risk and give visibility in risk and really share the ownership of mitigating risk? Because those to me are the key things that go hand in hand with actually just working out who is best placed to manage it. As a client, I'd probably sit there and say, even if your contractor, your supplier is owning and best placed to manage the risk, the outcome of that risk nearly always lands with the client and it always lands with the outcome of the project. So actually being able to foster really good constructive conversations around risk um, is the answer, a constant review, a constant um, engagement. And actually ensuring, and as I think again, Katie mentioned that, you know, understanding how that risk then goes down through the supply chain is also really important to, to us as the client. So, you know, we have our frameworks in place, but I don't ever want to lose touch with our second and third tier because they that risk will get passed down to them because they may be best placed to um, to manage it. But ultimately, if something were to happen, if the risk were to materialize, that soon finds its way back up into the project headlines. So making sure you understand how that filters down through and keeping that connectivity all the way through the supply chain um, is also one that I would say is really, really important. So I've touched on a couple. I probably could, you know, carry on for all the different elements. Um, I guess I just wanted to finish as I started, really. I think it's a great, um, great uh, booklet that's come together. I love the title. Actually, I think trust and productivity um, coming together is a really good um, indicator of how the industry needs to come together to crack some of the problems um, that we've got. Um, and I would really encourage everybody to, if you haven't done so, just pick it up and, and have a good read through. Thank you, Gren. Helen, that was superb. Uh, really open, frank, um, as to where uh, Heathrow have been um, the wilderness years as you walked into, because <laughs> I, I I enjoyed the Egan years where he came in, uh, probably where you are two years in, where he says, well, how the hell are you actually managing this with uh, your, your relationship with contractors? But it was all about lowest cost, tender everything, yeah. and Egan turned as well, and obviously as it went through the through the years, as ever with most organisations, things just get undone again and then, and then reinvented to get back to what is the uh, the right course. Um, before I open it up to the audience, there's a number of things that sort of stand out uh, between all the presentations that I would just like to go through quickly in turn. So if I start with Katie, please. Um, in terms of the behaviours, because the industry's got a poor um, reputation behaviour-wise, um, how do you think the playbook may be able to change those behaviours? Uh, you know, if getting them to actually use it in the first place, obviously the first hurdle is that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it can change behaviours. Um, you're right. I think the best thing that people can actually do is, you know, get a get a copy of it and actually identify the areas they want to target and open that dialogue. Because actually, I think a lot of poor behaviours come from the lack of trust or an expectation of poor behaviours beyond others. So, for example, um, uh, I won't partner early. I'm going to put this to competitive tender, so I'm, that way I'm going to get the best price. You know, I, I can't get the best price if I go into a single action negotiation because I'm going to get ripped off. You know, that's an assumption. But actually, genuinely having that collaborative discussion about, you know, okay, I want to go into a partnership. I want to work with you collaboratively early, but I need to, you know, get the best value. I need to get the price down. How can we do that in a collaborative way? Whether it's open book, whatever it might be but actually holding those discussions. Um, so I think, I think for me, it's using, using this, these tools, this document to open those conversations to break down mistrust and preconceptions. Uh, for sure, I think that's a good start. Um, I would say this, I think leadership from clients will be super useful because of course, you know, what a client asks for, we endeavor to give. So, so I, I yes. think, you know, 
setting out some of those principles by clients at the beginning is going to be really important. Behavior as well. Set, setting the cultural tone for an approach. Yeah. So, thank you, Kate. That's the uh, well answered. Thank you. Can I go to Helen now? Because given what you said, Helen, about um, basically going back to where you were uh, or where BAA was, it was before. Uh, uh, and he's where I broke away as an independent airport, if you like. Um, you've actually re-engaged the supply side, Helen, and do you think they've got this skill set to um, basically adopt the playbook? And Because presumably with some of the suppliers, they're coming into you with things they've been doing with the playbook or the principles of the playbook, playbook elsewhere. Um. So, I mean, obviously we've, you know, we've got a very healthy um, supply chain working um, with us. And actually when we last went through um, our tender for a renewal of, or for the next phase of our framework, um, you know, to me, actually the, the skills and the capabilities and the ideas that were being put on the table were phenomenal. So I actually think, you know, as an industry, we really shouldn't underestimate the amount of capability and the skills that we have to come together and and drive things forwards and to really apply those principles that are in the playbook. I think for me, the question is, you know, we've got the skills. We may not have the skills in every element. So I think there's an onus on being able to make sure that we're upskilling where we see gaps um, in amongst um, uh, maybe in, in smaller areas or, or smaller suppliers or smaller clients, you know, how can we harness the power of industry to upskill where it needs to be? Um, but I also think our real challenge is how can we make sure that we're utilizing those skills in the most efficient way to meet the demand that's out there? Because actually that's more my worry when it comes to skills. It's not about having the skills, it's having enough and being utilized in the right way for the mountain of work that I see happening across the industry, both in the UK um, and abroad. So that comes back to some of the conversations around productivity and efficiency and, and digital. So that, you know, what I would say that the human brain power, you know, can really be focused on finding those creative solutions for, for carbon, for, you know, um, for planning the roles and things. And we can let the technology and everything do the do the hard work for us. So for me, yes, we have a huge amount of skill, but how are we getting as much as we can out of it using all the tools that we've got, using all those tools in the playbook so that the people that we have available to us can go as far as we can make it? Thank you, Helen. That's very comprehensive. Thank you. Um, Alan, in terms of the building safety review by Dame Judith Hackett, uh, obviously she was very critical of the culture of our industry. Um, where do you think, well, in terms of the playbook being there now and given us a sort of a blueprint to follow, how much of an influence do you think will be in actually correcting those perceptions or well, obviously changing the culture as well? So we are actually more um, inclusive and looking at the right things for the right reasons. Thanks, Ren. Um, as you've alluded to, yeah, in, indeed, it's, it's all about the, the culture. And if I may um, address also Day, David Hills's um, qu question from uh, the Q&A at the same time, because it is also aligned to this point. It is, it is fostering that collaboration and trust and reliance and holding pe people to, to account. It's ca catching them when, when they fall, being able to sort of try out and in innovate. And innovation isn't just about um efficiency it isn't just about the the material component it's about the human interaction and by developing that that supporting cult culture of which you know fingers are not po pointed but we're all sort of pulling in that right direction then safety um fits perfectly within to that co context um the 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 playbook it, it itself seeks, seeks to fo foster that le leadership role and that's leadership at, at, at all levels and it's le leading those items that are pertinent to either that trade or specialism be it designer or 
or, or client. Um, Dame Judith recently came out with the observation that the industry is in compliance, not le leadership mode. This, we hope, helps to try and, and avoid just that, that really sort of se segmental approach to just doing enough into doing more because you're doing it as part, part of a, wi a wider team. Um, the points which Helen made on MMC are, are, are entirely re relevant because that allows qu quality control um, and perhaps the more ste steadied, um, me measured uh, approach to assembly being considered without necessarily the effects of weather, time or light being apparent on, on site. The other point to that, which also addresses some of the concerns raised by Dame J J Judith is, is the digital com component as well. And that record keeping, there's a, there's a chapter as Katie referred to within um, the playbook, which is solely there for ha handover um, and ensuring that those per persons using the, the building or the asset, those d d discharged with being able to maintain it are brought, brought in sufficiently early. No one is past a typhoon jet with a spat spanner and say, look, away you go, I'm sure she'll fly. You need to be brought in along that journey, um, brought in, in, in into how it works, how it operates, how to get the best from that. And again, that's increasing the awareness of its o operation and safety. It is also ensuring that all of those details pertinent to safety and maintenance are shared with those best placed then to operate it and therefore to pass that, that on um, and beyond. So I'd suggest that whilst there is no explicit health and safety component that, that, that addresses that with, within the play, playbook, it, it, is, it is sprinkled throughout all of those to topics. Katie, Katie, you have your hand up. I'm sure you'd like to follow on to that. Yeah, no, I was just going to build a little bit more on that. And I think one of the challenges we've seen, particularly with fire safety, is um, combat compatibility of components being brought together or components mm. designed when they've been brought together being incompatible for causing fire safety issues. And I think this really comes back to actually the collaboration, having the right people in the room, but also the element in the playbook where we talk about the clear understanding of roles and responsibilities. So in this example, actually, who, ha who has ultimate responsibility for fire safety, you know, the coordination of materials and elements to ensure that the whole piece is working together safely and appropriately and really setting that out at the beginning because I think sadly what we have seen is not having that clear accountability during the construction process who owns it who signs it off at various uh, points who has responsibility between coordinating between trades materials designs components of the building as well so I think for me collaboration and understanding of roles and responsibilities that we talk about in the playbook uh, will help support that too. Thank you, Katie. Just looking at the Q and A's, um, Viv Walsh uh, has written, what role, if any, does the panel think the lawyers have in changing culture and promoting the playbook and its principles? Who would like to take that one? I'm happy to have, have a go um, for that one. So, 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 sorry, Katie, no, <laughs> you're, you're going with the hand, approach. my apologies. Look, look, law, lawyers are, are certainly a part of that process. They help us all to form, formalise those arrangements. I think that some of the terms of contracts that we currently use don't necessarily lend themselves towards that, and therefore they're he heavily amended to be able to suit that. Some of the NEC suite are, are, are I think, more, more appropriate um, for the level of cl collaboration that we're looking at. At the minute, the industry is set on J JCT. So I think there's, there's a degree of evolution there that, that, that needs to happen to be able to help that and lawyers are an, an integral part. Um, the aim is that we don't use the contract to beat each other up but it's set there as a guiding pr principle as an e e ethos and as I say they are key to that. K Katie sorry I'll hand, hand to you. No I, I couldn't have probably said it much better myself I think you know I mentioned it in, in my presentation now, we are talking about trust and collaboration. We're not talking about blind trust. We're not talking about, you know, um, uh, so, so I think we're still going to need lawyers to engross some of the sentiments or, or things that we set out. Absolutely, for sure. So I, there's definitely a role for lawyers in this as well. Can I also, one of the things that came out quite pointedly in previous discussions on uh, adopting better ways of working is the is the 
divide sometimes between those project managing and those commercial managing, where there seems to be two, two different agendas on the go. Uh, and just make, basically making sure the team is working as a team, um, rather than they're all guarding their own particular piece that they're responsible for. So Katie, given, you know, from your supplier viewpoint, obviously facing clients, uh, do you find that because quite often with clients, you get a mix of uh, clients' own people and people they basically bring in as consultants? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think actually we quite often talk about the client. We don't have, you know, it's very rare that we will have a single-headed client. You know, we were, the, the client would be made up of a number of parties. They will have their consultants, their advisors, um, for sure. So, so, you know, even more so, that needs to make sure that we're all on the same page. Because otherwise, you know, you, you can get the Chinese whispers. This is what we've, this is how we interpreted what we've been told somebody wanted. But this is how we interpreted, you know, I'll take you back to my swing. That's what I thought I heard. That's what I thought um, they wanted. Uh, interesting. I want to pick up on one question that was at the top uh, from Rory. And it's a really good point is we have all talked a lot about risk. We haven't talked very much about opportunity. We've touched on innovation. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked about opportunity. And I think that is something that we need to turn the dial up on as well. You know, we have a culture of talking about risk and managing risk and risk avoidance and, or, you know, who owns risk and all the rest of it. But actually, and Helen talked about it, is <clears throat> with innovation. We need to set the right culture that's going to allow innovation. And there's going to be a bit of failure in that. But that's the way that you'll actually explore opportunity. So setting up a, a contract in a well where, in a way where you can fail safely or explore opportunities safe is going to be really important. Yeah, yeah, um, just going back to David, uh, sorry, thank you, Katie. Going back to David Hills again. I'm not sure if I could click on that, whether we can get David in. David, I think, are you, you should now, I think, be able to interact with us, I hope. Nope. <laughs> That doesn't seem to work. He's got quite a wide range in number of things on the go within that one. And it's, it all basically boils down to um, the existing culture and the skills to actually move forward. But I think the, the bottom line from what we've heard today is that we have come on leaps and bounds, both in terms of skills um, and culture, but it does rely on, as Kate was saying, strong client manage, um, management, project management, to actually lead from the front and actually set the scene. I think interestingly also nowadays is you're getting more um, good practice being transferred via the consultants to projects and via the actual supply side. So even if uh, a client is not necessarily up to speed what the latest technologies are, particularly digital, then they've got the situation now where they can actually, they're running there actually engaged early enough, they can actually have some meaningful input to actually uh, get the fundamentals correct from the outset of the project. Alan, can I ask you just in terms of where the playbook is now? So, where do you think in evolution terms will be with it? Let's say if you're looking ahead, say two or three years, what's your best guess that? Um, where you think it'll be and where, more importantly, where you hope it'll actually be with us. Thanks, Ren. Um, if, if, if I can start with sort of a slight, slightly shorter term aspirations first, the aim uh, for, for this year since its launch in November last is for all, all of us actually on, on, on that panel, on the authoring team and those who have been exposed so far is to, is to embrace it really, uh, to, to, pick, to pick the book up, um, as Helen has said, Pick it up, have a flip through, get into the bits that actually make sense for you and you think you can implement. It is not, as we said before, something that is, that is a sort of a bullet and either are all of those points um, relevant for all jobs, all clients, all, all teams, but effectively embrace it. Next part of that is, is effectively spread, spreading the word, is, is trying to get more people to have a look at it, see which bits work for them um, and to be able to road te te test that. Now, Key to that point is actually feedback. Feedback is is a gift and something that which we uh, which we de dearly love um, to be able to help to refine and to embellish the playbook. 
much like the public sector play playbook, which had a revision two years afterwards, I would see that we would uh, have the same as well. So after it's been road tested, used, we've got uh, pilot studies that we've worked through. Now we get, we're getting into the next stage and ensuring that the, these principles are deployed on, on, on our jobs. We'd love to hear, hear back from those who've used the playbook on their own pro projects, those things that have really worked, those things that might need some improvement or uh, or altering. So it is really, really great. Our aim to, to keep this as live as possible and to come back with um, that update. Um, answering one of the points within the Q&A, um, design is also on the working agenda at the moment. So designing for pro productivity. So there's a working group of uh, of designers, clients, contractors. Um, so we, we've broadened the group um, into le leading uh, national and in international uh, designers, architects, in engineers of all flavors into that group to sort of work through how, how do we ensure that designers are aware of pro product productivity, be it from constructional constraints through to innovation and, and how to best build that, that in. So that, that is the next phase uh, that we're looking to bring design into this now as well. Thank you, Alan. I think I think the obvious question that follows, really, if you go back to the comments being made about um, the building safety angle from uh, Grenfell and Dame Judith Hackett, is we're hoping this is going to actually give us what we want in terms of Dame Judith Hackett will look at this industry in a totally different light in the not too distant future. And I think what we've been saying here today is that. We've got the, the wherewithal to do that now. We just need to be, be basically talking to each other and sharing what is what we deem to be best practice and learn from each other. And picking up on Alan's point is it isn't a silver bullet. Every client will actually want to apply it in a way that suits their business best and then share that. And then if everybody does the same, then we get to a situation where it evolves naturally, organically over a long period. So we're at the end of the session. I think looking at the, the questions, I think with the help of Alan, we've got most of those, I think, covered in us in there. We've not actually touched on, I don't think. One of the bottom there is Tim Sharman. Do you have a working group for renewables such as solar, PV and energy storage? So, okay. <laughs> hmm? Not yet, but we. But I think Alan mentioned. You know, we do have. We are looking at designing for productivity. So whether whether that will get considered within that, we can take that back. Yeah, and there's the uh, net zero and biodiversity yeah. group within the CLC, isn't there? Which is basically the forum to actually take all those um, uh, technologies forward. Agreed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. I think uh, we're basically two minutes beyond the button. So can I thank the presenters very much for your time today and really insightful and really open as well. You, you, you said it as you see it and hopefully the audience found that the same as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for attending. And uh, you can get in touch with me via the BPF because we do have um, working sessions where clients bring along their best practice and share it. And anybody out there who's got something to share wants to actually pick up on some of the uh, sharing venues we have, then everybody's welcome. So we welcome any client to basically participate. So thank you, everybody. And that's close. <laughs>